closer. Wow, this is a short man's mic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm expecting the bishop to raise the podium at any moment. So hi, uh, my name is Troy Dunn, and uh, I'm just a Cougar fan, and they expressed a desire to have us come and help them pull off a really big event on a cruise ship. So I don't know how many people in this room have ever been on a cruise. Maybe I'll raise your hands if you've ever been on a cruise. Okay. Awesome. So what we are putting together, that was a lot of you, by the way. This is a cruise crowd. Um, we're going to ruin cruising for you. Once you've done this, you'll never want to go on any cruise other than a charter. So this is a full charter cruise. Um, that means we've, we've rented the entire ship 100%. There'll be no passengers on this ship that are not part of the Cougar experience. All of the entertainment is custom for us. We're bringing most of the entertainment. Um, we have this process we have to go through with contracts every time we sign another celebrity. And so from now until we cruise, you'll keep hearing announcements of new people who are joining the ship from us. So all I can tell you right now is the entertainers are all uh, what we call tier one. So they're people whose CDs you listen to, music you listen to on Sundays, people you've seen and listened to on television. They're big names. We will be dropping them one by one as we get our contracts with them and their dates scheduled. Um, they're very exciting. They're very excited. Many of them have cut their rates tremendously just because they're Cougar fans, BYU fans. So you'll, you'll know when you see their names, you'll be like, ah, I know why they did that. Um, we have VIPs from the football program, the athletic program signing on rapidly. I've only seen a few names myself, so I don't want to get myself in trouble by shouting out any names that I haven't been told I can say yet. Um, here's the ones I believe I have permission to say. So uh, uh, I'm looking. I, I'm looking to see who's supposed to shake their head no at me. Um, so whatever. I'm sure there's forgiveness. Uh, so I know, I know Tom Holmo's coming. I know that Kalani Sataki is attending with his entire family. I know that Jimmer Ferdet and his family are coming. I know that Austin Colley and his family are coming. Uh, they just told me that Max Hall and his family will be joining us. Tyler Hawes and his family will be joining us. And then I have parentheses around the others, which are the ones I'm not supposed to say yet, but I will say... I will say if you if I said to you name the <laughs> if I said name the ten biggest legends in BYU athletic history I would say seven of them are on this list that's what I would say um, anyway and the only reason we're not putting them out yet is because we're still having to make sure people's schedules are cleared and that their flights can be booked to get them from one place to the other but everything is getting very very big very quickly we. Uh, I can't exp emphasize enough when I say we have the whole ship. So it really will just be Cougar fans. Uh, our, our, there'll be an entire uh, Cougar memorabilia shop on board. There'll be our, our merchandise. The players and coaches will be involved in every activity. If you want to play Family Feud against some of the legends of BYU, that'll be an option for you. Uh, the excursions that happen offshore will have a Cougar twist to them. Uh, they're doing some fun things for us at the menu. Um, it'll be a non-alcoholic cruise, uh, so there'll be some really fun mixed drinks that will be available at all the bars. Um, I, I don't know what else to tell you about the activities, but it's, they're, they're tremendous. We have not made an announcement as far as sending out things to the general public because the Cougar Club itself has kind of swarmed the ship really fast when we started quietly dripping emails about it. Uh, KSL s broke the story against our will and ran it, so we did get a few folks who heard about it other ways. We have three categories of cabins that are already sold out. Um, so my, my suggestion would be if it's not, if you're not, I know I realize now probably I'm talking to the people that already have taken over the ship, but if there's some of you here that haven't booked yet, I would really urge you to jump on board, pardon the pun, uh, and get yourself some cabins. There are numerous people who are buying blocks of them because they know they're gonna bring their kids and their grandkids, but they're not yet sure which ones are available. So you are able to come on and say, I'm gonna take five cabins, but I don't have names for four of them, totally fine. We'll take, we'll take care of that for you so you can save your space. Uh, some of the biggest boosters and supporters and donors uh, of uh, BYU, thank you for who you are, uh, have taken large blocks of rooms for their employees and their favorite customers and stuff. So there is still space on the ship. The one thing that we haven't done yet is we haven't opened up the ability to just put down a small deposit 
which we have been inundated with emails from people asking because uh, currently everybody that's booked paid in full, booked their cabins. They got the first shot at all the greatest cabins. There are still some great ones on board. But all of those people who have now taken over the first part. I know, I'm out of time. I'm here. All right. Um, so um, we are going to announce to the entire Cougar universe globally that we are going to let them now start Garyhaven cabins with as little as a $250 deposit. We're announcing that next week. For those who are in this room today, if you want to be in front of that group, um, there's a QR code in the back. And Jason, will you just stand up real quick and wave so everybody sees who you are? So that's Jason Burgess. Move around because there's so many beams in here. Dance? Okay. So Jason will be at the back. I'll be standing with him. If you want to shoot the QR code that's in the back room, it's the only place we have it, that will put you on a list of priorities. So you'll be the very first people we send an announcement to when you can sign up for the $250 deposit. Uh, so that'll take you right to the booking site. If you don't need to, if, if, the, if the deposit's not a problem, you're ready to book a cabin and pay for it, that QR code will take you right to the booking page. If you just want to be on the list, to get the payment option, that QR code is the one in the back. That's the one we're concerned will probably fill up the rest of the ship. Where so, where? so we're going April 11th next. So this a year from this week, right now we would be halfway through our cruise. You'd already be listening. Oh, you'd already be listening to really great entertainment. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's a year from right now. So you have a whole year to plan for it. Um, and, and book your excursions and talk to your children and grandchildren and get everybody's schedules aligned. Yes. We're going down to Mexico. Sorry, we've got three ports down there. We're in charge of the ship, so we determine when it leaves, how long it stays, where it goes. We're booking the trip. Uh, Coach Sataki is the one that basically chose the dates for us, so we fall right after uh, Final Fours basketball and right before graduation. So that's the space that he's selected, and that's the week, that's the week we're going. Um, if you have any other questions, come join me in the back. Um, we'll have the QR code back there for you. Thank you to Mountain America, who made the entire thing possible. <laughs> Thank you. So just a couple things. Um, upcoming sports schedule, Tuesday, softball versus, that's today, softball versus Air, uh, Idaho State at 6 p.m. I know we had a switch on baseball. There's a baseball game tonight against Utah Tech. It got switched from yesterday to, to, to today. Tomorrow we have Iowa State at 6 p.m. On, on Miller Field softball. Baseball versus Oklahoma at 6 p.m. On, on Thursday. Friday, softball versus Iowa State again. And baseball versus Oklahoma. Both are at 6, so they're going to be going at the same time. And Saturday, softball once again at Iowa State at 1 p.m. And baseball versus Oklahoma at 1 p.m. We are going to invite all Cougar Club members to come to the softball game. So tomorrow morning, you're going to get an email that allows you and your family to go for free. So you get free tickets to softball if you want to go for tomorrow. Um, we're just making you aware of that. Watch for your email if you want to go. Our, the email is going out tomorrow morning. The game that is, is, is going to be for Saturday. It's the Saturday is the game that you're allowed to come for free. But the email is going out tomorrow morning. Um, We'll start off our program with Trent Pratt, our head baseball coach. Trent has been a part of the BYU baseball coaching staff for 10 years. And during that time, he's helped develop 45 West Coast Conference honorees, eight all-region players, five freshman All-Americans, two All-Americans, and 14 players who have been selected in the MLB draft. As a player, he played four seasons for the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, was the USA Today Utah Player of the Year and was a member of the 1997 Utah Baseball Junior National Team. He and his wife, Denise, Danise, Darice, they've got this spelled wrong, and I'm so sorry. Uh, they have six children, twins Morgan and Marley, Brooks, Tess, Blake, and Tug. We're going to turn the time over to Trent, for, and then uh, we'll go a little bit after that for He'll, he'll answer questions. Come on up, Trent. Thank you. Man, this is awesome. First of all, I want to thank you guys for having me here um, and for what the Cougar Club does for our athletic program for BYU baseball. I see I sit by you at the football games. Yeah, said the opening prayer. So it's good to see some faces that I've seen around that maybe I don't know real well. So 
that's the thing. One, I know Greg talked about, I grew up in Tula, Utah, a little, not far, not far from here. Yeah, yeah, my high school classmate right there, Nate Miller. Um, I grew up in a family, I had five brothers. And so my mom has a, she's going straight to the Celestial Kingdom for dealing with six boys and all the, all the problems we put her through. Um, so, and so, yeah, so I played at Arizona State and Auburn, and Greg said I played four years. I didn't, I didn't play in the big leagues. I played in the minor leagues for four seasons um, in the Phillies organization as a catcher. Um, now I have six kids, and my wife runs a volleyball club out in Mapleton that she's busy. She has, I think, 25 teams. She's kind of in charge of 250 girls. And so with six kids in that, um, she's, she's kind of the hero. She kind of keeps us together because we know right now I'm not home very much. So, But a little about our team this year. Um, Going to the Big 12, it's been a transition. We knew, we knew it would be that way a little bit, facing just on a week in, week out. Man, that's a lot, a lot better teams than we played in the West Coast Conference. And the season, we have a really young team. Uh, we played Baylor last week, and looking at their starting lineup, they had one upperclassman in their lineup, and we, they had one underclassman in their lineup, they had one sophomore, and we had one upperclassman in our lineup. We have a bunch of freshman sophomores playing, and we're competing every week. We lost two heartbreakers last week, we beat Texas two out of three the week before. So this team's trying to find a way to be consistent. How, how can we be the same team two weeks ago? That we, can, we, can we do that again this week? And that's kind of been the challenge for us is in this league, there's not a week off. If you don't play good, you're going to lose. You're, you're going to get beat because every team has really good players. But I like where that program sits for us for the future. We have, what, eight underclassmen on the position side getting a lot of experience this year. Getting to play at this level of baseball every day, that's only going to bode well for us going forward in the future. Um, our coaching staff, we have two new coaches this year. Adam Law, which you guys, a lot of you guys might know, Adam played here. I was lucky enough to coach Adam my first year here. Um, his dad, Vance, coached here for a long time. He was with the Dodgers organization. And so it's awesome to have him back and bring his expertise from professional baseball. And we know the Dodgers, man, have been the best team in baseball for the last three or four years. And so... It's a great to have him back on our staff. And Tyler Kuba, um, he was at University of Arizona. And his first year, he's doing our hitting. And his dad is actually a big league hitting coach with the Padres. And so our players are lucky to have met a great coaching staff that can help develop them and get them better. Um, so the biggest thing with our team is we want to just see them to continue to improve and get better every day. Um, it's a tight-knit group. They, I love coaching this team. It's a young group that they love, they love coming to the field. They love working hard. They love playing every day. And so it, it's been an awesome, an awesome season for me so far, just being around these kids and learning from them and the effort they bring to us all the time. Um, a couple of the highlights we have kind of on the offensive side this year is Easton Jones, a sophomore from American Fork. Um, he's like in the top, top in the conference in home runs. He's got nine home runs on the season. I think eight of those might be in the in conference play. Um, he's a sophomore. Luke Anderson is a sophomore from, from St. George, Utah. Went to Snow Canyon High School. And he played a little bit for us last year, and he's, he's leading off and playing for us all the time. Um, we have Kuhiwa Loy. He's a freshman from Maui, Hawaii. And he kind of came, came, came and we thought he was going to pitch for us. And then all of a sudden, through the fall, he started hitting a bunch of home runs. And he, he's continued to do that. He leads our team in RBIs as a freshman and hitting in the middle of our lineup. And Cooper Vest from last year. Cooper's been a mainstay. He was our one guy from last year that played a lot, and he's back this year. And he had a big day on Saturday. When we were down 13, came back and ended up losing 18 to 17. But Cooper had seven RBIs on the day, um, which was good to see. And then Colin Ruder, our catcher, that missed all last season with a bad elbow injury, was able to get healthy this year. And he's kind of like, he kind of keeps us together. He's a real good defender and does really good in the middle of the lineup. And I see him out for the CSI hat. Um, we have um, Mason Olson from CSI. If you guys have seen our games, our guys that finish the games, they're fun to watch. If you haven't had a chance to tune in, tune in. I think Mason talks to himself the whole time he's out there. Um, he, we can't get the sign to him fast enough, so he wants to pitch a throw. He's looking in the dugout, yelling at the pitching coach. Coach Alvarez, hey, what are we throwing? And, and him and Stone Cushing have been, done a really good job closing games out for us. Um, we kind of have just an acronym that we believe in our team, and we, we call it ACT with Honor. The A stands for accountability, and that's just we do what we say we're going to do. The C stands for charity. Um, we're here to serve other people. The T's for toughness. We're going to do whatever it takes. And the H is for honor. Like, we're, we're going to do what's right. And that's, what, that's how we want to build our program, on, on those values. And that, that aligns well 
playing baseball, but that aligns more with life. If we can teach those kids to have those attributes in their life, they're going to be successful not only at BYU, but when they go beyond here. And I think those are the same values that we, we believe in our faith as well. Um, we've had some good experiences to go out and, and serve in the community and do some things and to get these kids outside to understand that, hey, baseball, it, it's what you do, but it's not who you are. Like how you play doesn't determine what type of kid you are off the field. It doesn't mean you're a bad person because you went 0 for 4 and struck out four times. That's just, that's what you did in your game today. But your real value is what you are as a person and how you treat other people and how you treat your teammates. And that's what we're trying to instill in these kids. Um, and, and we see that last year started to grow. This year, it's getting a lot better. And so in the future, that's, that's the team culture we want to build. We want these guys to come together and love each other, play hard for one another, and build something really special. And we believe we can do that here at BYU. And we're excited about this team this year and what the future holds for years to come. Um, we're lucky enough right now we have, we have 10 players in professional baseball, four players at BYU. We have three players in AAA. Um, Daniel Schneeman, Justin Sterner, and Jackson Clough are all knocking on the door to get to the big leagues. Daniel Schneeman was in big league spring training. He made it to pretty much the last day. He was one of the last cuts. He got sent to AAA. Justin Sterner was the same way. I, don't, I think he threw eight or nine innings in spring training, in big league spring training, and didn't give up a run, didn't walk anybody. Um, so those guys are have a chance you know, soon, hopefully, to break in and be major league players, which is exciting for us in our program. And we have, you know, seven other kids that are between double-A AA and A-ball that are all right now playing really well. So that's exciting for me. Oh, so we have Michael Rucker. I, I was texting back and forth with Michael this morning. Michael's on, on the big league roster with the Phillies. He had a weird finger injury in spring training. So he's been on the DL. He says um, it's healed. He's got like four or five weeks to build his arm back up where he can join the Phillies um, in the big leagues and, and have a chance to help them. He was with the Cubs last year, so he's kind of excited to be on a new team. And so it, it's good. For, I love – I text those guys every couple of weeks to see how they're doing, and it's awesome how much they love BYU, and they all talk about the support they had when they were here. And that comes from the Cougar Club and, and the athletic department and all they did for them. So I'm really thankful for, for all the, the impact you guys had on their lives. You guys might not know it, but they feel it, and, and they love it. They love coming back. We have – out of those 10 kids, we probably have eight of them that are back in the fall all the time. They're at practice. They're working out. Um, Daniel's wife is actually an assistant coach on the softball team, Daniel Seaman. So he's around all the time. But that's great for our players to see those guys come back and how they work and how they go about their business because that's where our guys, that's where they want to be one day. And so we're real thankful for them and all they do. Um, and Chloe, I just want to say thank you. I I'm so grateful to be the head coach at BYU and be at this university and what it stands for. I grew up, like I said, I grew up in Twill. I grew up coming to games here, excuse me, as a kid all the time. My neighbor was Paul Clough. He played here as an All-American. And so to come back here is really special. Um, we all know it's a special place. It's unique, and it's different. And the love we have for this place is real. And so I'm, th I'm really thankful to be here and have the chance to, to lead this baseball team. Um, so I guess I'll open up to questions. Greg? Yeah. You know, I, I did grow – I don't know if I have one as much now. Growing up, I rooted for the Royals because I like George Brett and Bo Jackson. But there wasn't a team around. Most, I think most people from Utah my age either rooted for the Cubs or the Braves because that's, that's who we saw on TV. We had WGN and TNT. And that was the only way we were able to watch baseball games. So now I, I kind of root for the Giants because my 15-year-old boy loved Buster Posey and started being a Giants fan. So I, I kind of rile around him, and we check, we check the Giants box scores all the time. Yeah, actually, we used to have like a wristband on our arm. Two weeks ago, we went to, we upgraded. There's a little strip that we, they put in their hat, and we pre record the voice. So we hit a button, and then it tells them, hey, fastball, fastball away. So our pitcher goes, we had to pre record those in a program. Now his little button, he hits a button. So now all the guys on the field have this little strip in their hat. They use it in the big leagues a lot now. They put it inside their hat. And it's a voice, our pitch good voice, that's telling them, hey, fastball away, um, slider down and away. So it's telling them, what, or, or, hey, pick to, pick to first. So this kind of like the catcher's usually giving signs. Now now there's no chance of anyone picking our signs. 
unless, unless our first baseman has his volume turned up too high and the guy on first <laughs> might hear him. So we make sure the first baseman's got to turn his volume down so it's not too loud. No, we tell our guys, you, ha you have the freedom to shake. We want, if, uh, if he calls a pitch, hey, he calls a fastball, he wants a slider, we want our guy to throw the pitch that he's most committed to. Um, if he's thrown a pitch that he doesn't think is right, then there's an excuse when he comes in. Or he's not, maybe not committed to that pitch because he wants something else. So they have freedom to shake. Our pitch, we give him a recommendation. Um, Coach Alvarez does a good job as far as like scouting and knowing the other hitter. But if they feel like they have something else or something else working better that day, they have – it's not like, it's not like, hey, you have to do it, what we say. Um, we will say, like, hey, this is highly recommended. I know I was a catcher, so sometimes I threw out a fastball, he'd shake. I'm like, no, this one's right. <laughs> if he shook again, then I was going to go to the mat and have a conversation. Hey, this is right. Like, you've been in the bullpen. I've been watching this guy. Let's have a conversation. And if he felt like that one was better, then, okay, let's go with that. Or if I could let him know why this was better to – Convince him of that, then we'd go with the one I put down. So, so who's calling the pitches? Then? Coach Alvarez calls the pitches. Yeah. Since that's a transmission, is there any way to have that signal? Not that I know of. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. Yeah. You, you get that out of the air, and someone else is out, and they're getting the signal. It's like, well, okay, we got it. That might happen the first three innings on Saturday, and we got it fixed. So. <laughs> What's that? Those are my sons. They had games. <laughs> yeah, they had games. So yeah, you guys seen I have usually two little boys that fly around the field and they'll, he'll be there tonight. He was excited. He goes, what jersey are we wearing tonight? And I was like, blue one. He goes, okay, good. And he doesn't have practice or a game tonight. So well, I know last week he goes, dad, should I go to practice? Should I come to your game? When we're at Utah and I go, Whatever you want, he was like, I probably can't miss practice. So I was like, yeah, it's a good call, so go to practice. Dad, you know about Lance and Sean. Lance hmm? is a big difference in Mexico. It makes it helps us a lot during practice. When we come back in January and February, um, if we get, I'd say, three or four inches overnight, four inches overnight, and the temperature's not like zero, what we do is we flip the heaters on the field. We try to keep it at, at about 45 degrees. And so a lot of times, if we get three or four inches, Four inches overnight, we'll be able to practice at one o'clock the next day. Luckily, we, the season a lot weather's been a lot better this season than last year. So, um, but no, it, it's been a, just for us to get outside. And we know in Utah, if it's forty degrees here, that's not like forty degrees like in Texas or something like that. It it feels okay here compared to down there. Oh, back there. Hmm? Yeah, um, it's a little bit different feeling from, from like ball, ball bouncing on grass to dirt because they're two different surfaces. So I know early in the season, we usually go to St. George a couple weekends or Vegas to practice to get on grass and dirt because a lot of the fields in the Big 12 are actually turf. Um, I think Baylor, Oklahoma State, and I'm, I'm missing one, and, and TCU, I mean, the only fields that are grass. Every other field in the Big 12 is turf. Now, when the new schools come in, Arizona, Arizona State, um, th those are grass and dirt as well. But all the other schools in the Big 12 are on turf. So I think it's more and more common. I think just the expense and how hard it is to maintain a field to keep it nice it is hard. And so a lot of college fields, yes, a lot of them are going turf, especially in climates like us. It, it makes total sense for us to have. I love grass and dirt. I'm a purist. I'd rather play on that. But as far as practice-wise goes and getting on that field all the time and keeping it nice, and our climate, if we're, if we're on that field in March and February, the grass isn't growing. And we just beat it up, and then it doesn't have a time to grow again. So in our climate, like, turf helps out a lot. Does that contribute to injuries like it does on, on football fields or things like this? Area? Yeah, you know, we haven't seen, well, I, like, knock on wood, I haven't seen a lot of that for us. Um, maybe it's a different type of sport, not as much, as many plays cutting going laterally or hitting our head on it. Um, we haven't seen a big problem with it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have him come in and talk to the team? And if so, who would you have? Yeah, we've had um, Wally Joyner came in and talked to us a couple years ago. Not He's not a former BYU player, but Bryce Harper came and talked to our team two or three years ago. Um, 
Jeremy Guthrie came a while ago and spoke to our team. Michael Rucker that's in the big leagues, he's recently he's come back and talked quite a bit. I'm trying to think if I'm missing anyone else that have come back. I know there's a couple more I, I can't think of off the top of my head, but we try. If they're around, we want our alumni to come back. What sort of impact does that have on the players? It's good that they hear, they hear their voice and not mine because they, they hear mine all the time. It's good to hear because those guys will talk about the same things, but I think it's different coming from a guy that's been there and done it for a long time, and it's just – and they might say it in different words than I say it, but it's the same message. So it's awesome. We try to – in the fall, we're kind of like a speaker series where once a month we have someone – a business person, a former baseball player, come in and try to talk to our team just about different things. He, he's pretty close. He kind of he has to wear a brace on his left shoulder, and it's great to have him back. I mean, we missed him all last year. He, I think he tore his hamstring the second weekend of the season, so we missed him all year. And then at West Virginia, the opening of the Big 12, we slid into second base and kind of hurt his shoulder. No, it, it's great to have him back, have some leadership out there. It's been a big help. You're good? Okay, awesome. Thank you again. Thank you, Trent. We appreciate you. We are now happy to hear from Gordon Eakin. Gordon has been BYU's head coach since 2003. He has a record of 800 wins and 372 losses. He's a three-time Mountain West Co Conference Coach of the Year and a five-time West Coast Conference Coach of the Year. As a baseball player, he played shortstop on the internationally ranked Larry H. Miller Toyota fast pitch team. I think he should have said softball. He's a softball player and was inducted into the Utah Fast Pitch Hall of Fame. He and his wife, Bambi, or excuse me, Barbie. I, I got to get some glasses here. I apologize. <laughs> he and his wife, Barbie, have three children and 10 grandchildren. Uh, Coach, come on up. It's your turn. I'm glad he called her Bambi because I'm going to tell you some stories about her. <laughs> so, first of all, I want to. Um, tell you Trent is an incredible baseball coach and I've been here I actually started in July of 1999 and our first softball season was in 2000 so I've been here a while and I've worked with Vance Law, Mike Littlewood and now Trent Pratt and Trent is absolutely the kind of man um, that we need leading our young men at BYU so I'm grateful to to share Miller Park with Trent and one thing I realized while he was sitting down there talking about the difficulties of playing in the Big 12 is we need to have them build us a crying room at Miller Park <laughs> where you and I can spend a little time um, because part of my talk is going to be about the agony of defeat um, and I I prepared I used to hate to speak in public but then BYU has has got me to the point where now I have people in the room going like this, like, stop talking. You're, you're going too long, so I'll try not to go too long. But um, I prepared a big, long thing that I wanted to talk about today because um, that's just who I am. I like to be prepared. And, and then this morning I thought, they didn't come here to hear that. In fact, you guys, it, the room is packed. You probably came here to, to see Kevin talk. But we only t hired him this morning, so you get me. Um, <laughs> And hopefully I, can make, hopefully I can make some of my comments valuable to you and worth your time here. Um, I, I can, so this, I'm going to just kind of use it as bullet points, but I, my whole talk is kind of capsulized from Curtis's prayer, opening prayer, where he said, we hope that the energy in this room can be taken out to the world or something to that effect. And I got to tell you, that's what it's all about is the energy in this room being taken out to the world and make a positive difference through the talents that we've been blessed with, both on and off the field, both you and me, that we can take it out to the world and make a difference. So I want to talk a little bit about how hard that is in Division I sports and how hard that is for everybody in this room that bleeds blue because we all bleed blue. 
and we're all armchair quarterbacks. I am the best armchair quarterback in this room, but I'm sure there are others that will rival me that sit at Lavelle Edwards Stadium or on your couch at home and say, why did we call that play? We need a different play. Why can't we get the right running back? Why can't we get the right quarterback? Why can't we get the right punter? I mean, we all do that. It's just the nature, it's just human nature. And so we're all normal. And I'm, I am definitely an armchair quarterback. So um, I'm just gonna go off script a little bit and, and just say, I am very normal. And I'm gonna tell you how normal I am. You guys came here to hear a little bit about softball and maybe a little bit about our coaches, um, but I'm going to tell you how normal I am. Last night I'm sitting on the couch watching TV with my wife, and of course I've been married for 39 years to Barbie, not Bambi, <laughs> and I'm watching what she wants to watch because i got to figure it out. I've been married 39 years, and I'm watching what she wants to watch, and I am not interested in Dancing with the Stars, but I'm watching it anyway. And I'm kind of dozing off, and all of a sudden I feel a finger come over to my ear and pull a hair and pluck it out that I feel come out of this ear over here. <laughs> and so I, uh, I mean, that's what happens in my house. And then my wife proceeds to say, man, we got to trim your eyebrows and your nose hairs and your ear hairs. And I know that happens in your houses too. And that involves husbands and wives, by the way. So I am extremely normal. Um, I bleed blue, and, and I want you to know that there is nothing rare or different about a BYU coach or a BYU fan. We are all the same, and we're all trying to do something remarkable in the world with the, with the opportunity that we have. But I want to go back and talk a little bit about being an armchair coach. Um, I'm consistently trying to figure out how to be a better coach, a better human being, a better mentor to our players, a better father, a better grandfather, but I am not good at losing. That's the one thing that I have never been good at doing is losing. And I, you know, they say the, um, the agony and the ex ecstasy of sports. So the ecstasy is a victory, like when we beat Oklahoma on Friday. So Oklahoma is the perennial national champion, three-time national champion in softball. They have five players in their lineup that are on the USA national team currently. They have 10, in softball, we have 10 players that play not just nine. And I guess in baseball, in the, in the big leagues, you have 10 in the American League. Yeah, yeah with, the, with the designated here, but we always have 10. And they have 10 All-Americans in their lineup. They had not lost a game at home in a brand new $48 million stadium that is unbelievable. And they're three time defending national champions. They had not lost a game since um, at home since 2017. And so Thursday night, we lost to them, okay? That's what everybody expected was we lost to them, except for us. We didn't expect that. Thursday night, we came out and beat them. Or Friday night, we came out and beat them and shocked the world. Now, I can tell you that that's, that is the ecstasy of victory. That is, I mean, with standing room, and this place was sold out with standing room, they had 6,000 people at a softball game, all yelling boomer sooners, and it, it was just incredibly loud, and we beat them, and I didn't hear one more boomer sooner the whole <laughs> rest of that night, but it was just an incredible experience. And so winning is, winning it's easy to be humble. It's easy to um, be in a good mood. It's easy to be kind to others. It's easy to serve others. But what happens with the agony of defeat? And that's where I struggle. And that's where I'm sure that because you guys bleed blue, many of you struggle with that too. So being an armchair quarterback, as we're going through a game, football game, basketball, oh, and talk about agony of defeat, you know, this week we learned that we lost Mark Pope. Now, pretend like we didn't hire a great new coach today, but that hurts. That's agony of defeat. We had a great basketball season and great players, most of them coming back, and all of a sudden, wow, what an empty feeling, and it hurt, and we weren't sure where we were going, and so how do we deal with those feelings? And so I want to just focus a few of my comments today on the agony of defeat to see if I can help you a little bit, but mostly if some of you can call me and help me 
learn how to deal with defeat because I am not good at it. So um, I think Christ counsels us to do our very best, to try our very best, to do all we can to be successful and then find peace, comfort in and through him. I think that's what we're counseled and I think that's what's different about this place than most other places. And um, I think we need to find peace through the pure love of Christ to find that humility and that service for others. And I don't know about you, but that is really difficult in the heat of battle in a Division I sporting event. How, how can you be humble to your opponent? I want to kick their butt. <laughs> okay? I want to take it to them. So, but how am I supposed to find humility? It's a real balancing act for sure. And I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and tell you about what Elder Irene said here many, many years ago. I think Tom Homo was here, but I don't think he was the AD yet. It's when Rick's College decided to do away with athletics. Many of you will remember that. And all of us coaches, including me, I was here, we were scared to death that they were going to do away with athletics at BYU as well. We thought that's where the church was going. So Elder Irene and Elder Scott came to talk to all of us coaches and administrators in the athletic department. We have other coaches that were here at the time. And, and now, this isn't an exact quote, but I'll tell you what I heard. And I think it's pretty darn close, okay? He said that if we as coaches will be doing what we're supposed to, the Lord would raise athletes to fill our programs. And then in his next breath, he said, and you better make your sports relevant on the national stage because the world doesn't pay attention to losers. <laughs> now, you talk about pressure. And I think about that quote every single day. I think about that in the way I conduct myself on and off the field. What am I doing as a coach to make, oh, and then I, I left this part out, which is really important. He had then said, BYU Athletics will stay because it is the second greatest tool we have to open doors for missionary opportunities. But if you don't win, it don't, the world doesn't pay attention to losers, so you better win. And so I have learned that that is true in a lot of different ways through my time here. And um, in a minute, I'll give you one of those ways that happened to us this weekend, which was pretty incredible. But I'm going to go back to how do we deal with the agony of defeat? Because I know all of you, you have human feelings that none of us want. It's not who we are, but it's what sports does to us. So I'm going to counsel myself while I kind of counsel you with what Elder Uchtdorf told us. He says, some suppose that humility is about beating ourselves up. Humility does, not, uh, humility does not mean convincing ourselves that we are worthless, meaningless, or of little value, nor does it mean denying or withholding the talents God has given us. We don't discover humility by thinking less of ourselves. We discover humility by thinking less about ourselves. So I have thought a lot about that comment and how to bring that into sports when I want to beat the other team really badly and when we're losing I get I just get frustrated and upset and how do I bring that humility into that so I'm going to give you a few points that I'm working on to try to make that humility a little bit better because I do not like to lose and I will never like to lose whether I'm here as a coach or whether I'm here as a fan I do not like to lose and I'm going to continue being an armchair quarterback so um, but I'm going to give you some some things about humility. So I could insert a word into Elder Uchtdorf's um, comments, and I could say, for instance, some suppose humility is beating ourselves or others up. And we do that in sporting events. I do it to my own players privately. I never try to belittle them publicly or or chew them out publicly or make them feel less valuable publicly. But... You know, we, we have self-talk. We're talking to ourselves. And these are the kinds of things we, we say because we all bleed blue. We aren't very good today. We, why can't we make better plays? Now, I do this when I'm watching football, when I'm watching basketball, when I'm coaching softball. Why can't we make better plays? Why does that coach make such stupid decisions? 
So I'm going to go sideways a little bit and talk about Bambi, I mean Barbie. <laughs> so my loving wife of 39 years, who I've had to teach that in football it's the 50-yard line, not center court. <laughs> um, but I, but she's, a, she's my best friend and, and so worth it. But I'm going to give you an example of my wife being an armchair softball coach. We're playing in Missouri in the national tournament. I mean, we've played in 15 or 16 national tournaments. We've won 15 or 16 conference championships. I mean, we've been very successful, but we're in Missouri playing Nebraska in a game, and Nebraska has a really good pitcher, and we're not hitting her very well. And so we get a runner on third base, and we have a, a hitter up that's good at bunting. And in my wisdom, I think I'm going to squeeze right here. And for those of you who don't know what a squeeze bunt is, it's when you have a runner on third base, and with the pitch, they take off running to home plate. The batter turns around and bunts the ball, hopefully on the ground. You score a run, and the coach is a genius. Okay? So I call that play. I think this is going to work. Runner takes off, perfect bunt. Third baseman comes and makes a glove flip to home plate perfectly for an out, which I thought she was safe. I lost the argument, but um, we lose the game 2-1. to one. And we go back to the hotel and my loving wife says what kind of an idiot calls a bunt with a runner on third base <laughs> now again this is a woman that thinks the 50 yard line is center court so i have to explain to her that that's called a squeeze bunt dear and now every time i'm calling a squeeze bunt which i still do i have to worry about what i'm going to get at home if that doesn't work so those are things that in, in the heat of battle that we think those negative thoughts, what if we switched that a little bit? What if we found humility in sports the best we, we can by saying these young men and women are incredible examples of what's right in the world? Because they are. Winning or losing, they are incredible examples of what's right in the world. Or saying... Boy, they've done some great things today. They've made some great plays today. Yeah, we're behind 13 to nothing, but they've made some pretty good plays, okay? Um, they're competing really hard. They're giving it the effort. And then my most important one is that coach is pretty darn smart. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. That coach is pretty darn smart. There are young and old softball fans. I mean, everybody thinks that football, and rightfully so, makes such a positive difference in the world with the way they compete, and they do, and men's basketball, and I'll add baseball, because those are bigger, more attended, more visual sports in the world. But softball makes a difference in, in sports, too. There are young sp softball fans and, and old softball fans that we make a positive difference with. And I told you I was going to read you something from this weekend that I'm going to do now. I should have had it pulled up, sorry. But just bear with me one second. Because I got this last night, right after my wife pulled that hair out. <laughs> and it was a really good distraction for me. Um, It's from a, a young lady named Natalie Davis, and she wrote, Good evening, Coach Eakin. I wanted to make sure I took the time to say thank you. Now, let me go back. She is the Associate Director of Events and Game Operations at Oklahoma. Okay? So she goes back and says, I want to make sure I took the time to say thank you. You, you and your staff and team were the best visiting team I've ever dealt with in my seven years at Oklahoma Athletics in multiple sports. With most teams, only the director of operations talked to me, but each day every staff member, coach, and player greeted me, said please and thank you, and goodbye. Thank you again for a great experience and how great it was to work with you. I wish you all the best going forward and, looking for, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Now, because, I mean, we lost the first night. We could have been buttheads, but we weren't because that opportunity right there could lead to something really big because we represented the right way and we represented with as much humility as we can find in a loss. 
My wife is really good at controlling my humility after a loss. She kind of hides me away and takes center stage. And so she, after the loss, that Natalie probably didn't see me as much as the rest of the, of the team. But we can make a, a positive difference with the way we compete. And there's nothing wrong with be co being competitive or wanting to win. I think that's important. But learning how to focus on eternal things in our life while striving to win is very, very important. So next time you're on the couch coaching or I'm on the field coaching, we have to try to keep some perspective. Doesn't mean we don't, we don't try to win, but we have to try to keep some perspective. So um, I probably, I'm, I'm a little goofy as you guys can, can, can see. I've, I spoke at several of these. The first one I ever spoke at was at the uh, Utah Hotel. I think Greg was there. It was at the Utah Hotel. I think it might have been owned by the church by then, but I'm not sure. Twelfth floor, all glass windows. And I brought our pitching coach who throws 85 miles an hour, and we pitched from 43 feet. So it was 85 miles an hour. I brought our pitching coach and our catcher to give a demonstration of pitching. And I'm sitting there on the side, and he's throwing the ball really hard, and I'm thinking, man, he's going to break a window. <laughs> but it, it worked. It was really good. So um, now I want to just take a minute um, and tell you a little bit about our team. And hopefully you guys can take that message of we make a difference. This room makes a difference in the room through athletics. Okay, and that's really what I wanted to point out. Um, but we, we've won, like I said, a lot of conference championships. We've been to the NCAA tournament a bunch of times. We've had All-Americans and Players of the Year. And, um, but that was, and that was in four different conferences. We played in the Mountain West, the WAC, the PCSC, and the WCC while we were trying to find a home in the Big 12. The Big 12 is significantly different significantly different. Oklahoma, they are, they are the pinnacle of softball, okay? And I already told you about them. When we beat them, they were number one, number one, number two in the two different polls, and we beat them. Now they've slid to number two. Texas is now number one. So Texas is number one. Oklahoma's number two. Oklahoma State that we beat three weeks ago is number five. Kansas was 24. They probably slipped out of the poll this weekend. Baylor, 25. I mean, it's one week after another in the Big 12 that you don't get a break, just like with baseball. It is great competition, but if we can compete the way we have been and we can make a difference like we did with Natalie, then I can find joy and happiness in what we're doing. And I want to tell you guys that um, the NIL has, has bled into every sport. I mean, Oklahoma's main pitcher was given $50,000 of NIL money and got her veterinarian school paid for somehow, some way. So it's not just football that competes like that. It's everything. And we did it so far without one of our players being on NLI money. Now, in the future, we're going to have to probably get in the game a little bit better to compete because it's going that way across every sport. But what you guys do, and this is what I want to end with, what you guys do and the support that you give the athletic department makes us competitive to a level that we can beat Oklahoma, okay? Gives us great facilities, gives us an administration that gives us almost everything that we want. Not everything, I don't know if Tom's here, but not everything we want, <laughs> but almost everything that we want. And, and it comes from the foundation of the athletic department, which is the Cougar Club. We are so grateful for what you guys do. We are so grateful for the support that we have. I am so grateful to be here at BYU. I've had opportunities to coach elsewhere and never once thought about leaving because it makes a difference to me what kind of kids I coach. It makes a difference to me what kind of support I have from administration and a fan base. And so all of you spending your time today to come here and hear a little bit about baseball and softball, we appreciate that because we are part of the family. We want to be part of the family. We need to be part of the family because we will make a difference in somebody's lives through your efforts and then through what we do. So it is so much appreciated, um, both in, in 
you know, in, in um, sacrament meeting, fast and testimony meeting, which we had last week because of conference, um, they always thank you for bearing your testimonies publicly and privately in your heart. So I want to thank you for monetary donations and for donations in your heart, for your support. It means so much. We're incredibly grateful for everything that we have. I look forward, I know a lot of you in the crowd, but I look forward to meeting more of you as time goes by. Uh, but you'll have to hurry because I'm a, little, I'm a little longer in the tooth, might not be here for 10 more years. So you have to come quicker, like Saturday. <laughs> and uh, be happy to shake your hand and tell you thank you personally. Okay? Oh, questions. A few questions. Yes. My real thoughts about losing Texas and Oklahoma's is great. Get out of here. <laughs> Plain and simple. I, I was at that Simpson demonstration in Zion Creek the other night. I never forgot that. It was fun, wasn't it? And I was glad they put a big net up. There. little nerve-wracking, but it was fun. Yes, that was a prayer. Oklahoma invited us to um, join them in prayer. After they lost. Amazing. All three days. Amazing. Yeah. I love watching these teams play. They're amazing. You've got two girls, two of our Bayani sisters, who are in prayer. Are there any more prayer? Any more Ogbayani sisters? No, unfortunately. <laughs> um, Benny Ogbayani, who played for the Mets, that's his daughters, and... Um, I was fortunate to find Ilana, the younger one, our shortstop, who's an incredible player, during the pandemic when we couldn't go out and recruit, all we could do is watch the game streamed. And I watched every game in the country streamed. And I was fortunate that most coaches didn't do that. And I was lucky to get her. And then her older sister played at Cal, was unhappy, graduated. And then with the experience that her sister has here, non-member, but what a great young lady. Um, because of the experience she had here, her sister wanted to come here too. And it's been a blessing to have them both. Violet Zavodnik is our center fielder. She is an incredible player. She was uh, the 25th rank player in the country. But she's had a string of concussions, and last year was out for about a month with concussions, and this year was out for three weeks when we went to Texas, and I don't know, we played in Oklahoma State. I think we didn't have her, but she got hit in the helmet again uh, in game two in the third inning in Oklahoma, and the concussion came back, and she'll be out again all, ne all this week and be reexamined next week. But... She's been, when she's out of the lineup, it changes us. She's an incredible player and a great hitter. So we're hoping we can get Violet back by um, the series against Baylor because she makes a big difference. Maybe one more. That's very insightful f from you. You you obviously are a fan. We, we, last year we started seven freshmen, and we went into the year very excited about our pitching staff. And our number one pitcher, Kaysen Korth, um, threw 13 innings to start the season, and now she's out for the rest of the year with a back issue. And so she's redshirting, and that really changed our pitching staff big time this year. And then Chloe Temple, who's our senior, has some arm issues, and she was out for two weeks, and now she's just not the – not. she has a slap tear. Don't put this out to the media because we kind of try to hide it. But she has a slap tear in her left arm, so it hurts her every pitch. And <coughs> um, so she's kind of someone we can use sparingly, but she's just not the same kid. So we beat Oklahoma with two freshmen. I mean, but those two freshmen also – can disappear all of a sudden in the Big 12. And so we've really been up and down with pitching. We're hoping to, that Kaysen's 100% healthy next year. 
that our two freshmen have great experience going into next year that will help us. But then we're going we're gonna to need to get a, a superstar pitcher because softball is pitching. We're going to have to get someone in the transfer portal the middle of May, and we'll be working on that hard. And it's just whether or not we can figure out how to compete with $50,000 in veterinarian school. I'm not sure we can. But we'll sell BYU for what it is and how great it is and hopefully find that right person that's guided here that will help us with pitching. But we have a great team. We can score. We can, we're, we're fun to watch in the scoring area. We're not so fun to watch in the runs that we give up. Okay? And so we're, we're going to correct that. We're going to fix that. But it is, it's the cards we've been dealt with. And next year, hopefully, your insight will, will help us. We're, we're working that direction. Okay, one more. You darn right he was. <laughs> now, the reason I say that, Gail's not here, is she? Because I am very close to the Miller family. Um, I, I played in the Oakland A's organization, and then when I came out of baseball, Larry called me up and said, come play fast pitch softball for me. And I said, softball's for girls. I'm a baseball player. <laughs> and then he said, he's a very convincing man, by the way. And he said, why don't you come out and try it? I think you'd like it. So he finally convinced me to come out. I was a shortstop. And he said, if you come out, I'll let you pitch and bat fourth. And I thought, wow, that sounds fun. So I went out. He didn't let me pitch. <laughs> but he did let me bat fourth. And I think I struck out every single time I went to the plate for the first three weeks. Could not hit it. And I thought, this sport is is a challenge and it's fun and I'm going to master it. So I played for Larry for 15 years after that. And then I ended up, Larry hired me because I couldn't get time off work to go play softball. So Larry hired me as a general manager and I knew nothing about the car business. <laughs> That's Larry. But, um, I, and so I could get time off work. But Larry was a very good pitcher in his younger days before he decided to, um, be an incredible businessman. I was in his office the day Sam Battistone called him and asked him if he'd buy the Jazz. And he said, no, I don't want to buy the Jazz. We all know the story from there. But um, Larry's a great man and was a great pitcher and an incredible sponsor for men's fast pitch softball. Okay, so I'm going to leave it with that because I'm sure you guys want to get out of here. But thanks for having me, and we'll see you at the park. Let's give him one more round of applause. We are grateful to have uh, amazing coaches here, and, uh, and we really do appreciate them. All right, we've got a lot of stuff to give away. I hope you're okay with that. Um, you get help.